This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Support Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 264 of the program. Today is Friday, October 30th, and we have quite the show for you this week. But before we start talking politics, I want to thank all of the people who make this show possible. All of our latest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us. And that includes Anna B.W., Celestial Equinox, Hector Rivera, Janine Cox, Joseph Laundry, Lisa Breyer, Lizbeth Raphael, Martin Fosby, Mickey Carrier, Molten Keep, Tossin Ajik 2, Trip Squad Org, Valera Windsor, and Zachary Fluke. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. Well, folks, this is the last episode before the big election, and um, it's going to get spicy. It's going to get uh, rough going to be a bumpy ride so uh buckle up this week the u.s senate confirmed a far-right extremist amy coney barrett to the supreme court we'll discuss the aftermath of this and i will make the case for court packing and we'll talk about what democrats are saying about the prospect of court packing donald trump is already laying the groundwork to steal the election and misinforming the public about what is and isn't illegal while his own advisors namely mark meadows make a legitimate victory less likely for him by putting his foot in his mouth and as he makes his last pitch to voters, he chooses to dedicate that time to attacking Ilhan Omar in the most racist and xenophobic way imaginable. So we'll talk about that. Also, Green Party presidential candidate Howie Hawkins takes a shot at Ocasio-Cortez and accuses her of stealing his Green New Deal idea and watering it down. Bernie Sanders explains how he'll hold Joe Biden accountable if he's elected, and we'll talk about his bid to maybe be Biden's labor secretary, and also what a Fox host, uh, Stuart Varney, had to say about that. And finally, I'll close out the show by giving you my pre-election expectations about what we can expect if Joe Biden or Donald Trump is elected, what the next four years will bring us in American politics based on the outcome of this election. So we've got a lot to talk about. Let's get right into it, and um, I hope you all enjoy the show. So believe it or not, we are just one week away from the big election, and even though Joe Biden is in a really good spot, if you've followed the polls, I'm still really hesitant to say that this election is going to produce either result. I mean, Joe Biden is likely to win. Uh, I expect him to win. I would predict that he would win, assuming our democracy functioned normally. But I, I just don't have that much confidence in our system and in our institutions. So Donald Trump can still pull off a victory. Maybe he wins outright, fairly. But there's a lot of situations where Donald Trump can win illegitimately, but still win nonetheless, which is all that him and Republicans care about. So first and foremost, voter suppression is a really big issue. It's a really big issue. So Joe Biden has to overwin in order to make sure that he does win. He's currently uh, basically statistically tied with Donald Trump in states like Georgia. But we already know what's going to happen in Georgia. As we saw in the 2018 gubernatorial race, that election was basically stolen from Stacey Abrams because Brian Kemp, as Secretary of State, basically rigged that election in his favor, purged voters off the rolls, new voters that she signed up, disproportionately black voters. So we already have to anticipate that there's going to be some shenanigans, a high level of rat fucking in each state, and we have to try to brace ourselves because there's a lot can, that can happen. Now, I talked about Barton Gellman's article in The Atlantic titled The Election That Could Break America, where he goes over the strategies that Trump's legal team is openly discussing to basically have Donald Trump hang on to power even if Joe Biden wins the election. And we're not talking about Joe Biden just winning the popular vote. We're talking about a situation where Joe Biden, even if he wins the Electoral College as well as the popular vote, Trump can still hang on to power. 
Now, how would this work in actuality? What Trump can do, as he's been telling us and signaling that he will do, is maybe if it's really close in a state like Florida, he can declare the results of that election illegitimate. He could say that there's widespread fraud. And as a result of said fraud, he can request that his loyalists in Florida, Ron DeSantis, you know, their Republican-controlled state legislature, send their own Republican electors to the Electoral College. So even if Florida goes to Biden, he can just say it's fraudulent and they could send their own electors to vote against the will of the voters in that state. Now, they can't pull this off if it's a decisive victory, but if it's really close, Trump can potentially get away with this. And guess what? Trump is already laying the groundwork for this type of rat fucking. He tweeted out, big problems and discrepancies with mail-in ballots all over the USA must have final total on November 3rd. Now, first and foremost, he presented zero evidence for this claim. There's absolutely no reason to believe that we're seeing widespread discrepancies with mail-in ballots. That's coming from nowhere. So as we uh, anticipated, he is making this claim with no evidence to back it up. And on top of that, he's making a very specific claim. We must have the total on November 3rd, meaning that any votes that come in after November 3rd are automatically invalid. And if that isn't the case, then I might say that they are rigged and we might have a legal battle on our hands, which could ultimately go up to the Supreme Court, which he now has a huge advantage in since Amy Coney Barrett was just confirmed. Now, last week, there was a really huge voter rights case that made it to the Supreme Court with Pennsylvania. This time in Wisconsin, there was another case that made it, and uh, the voters here did not get a victory. But even more important than what we're seeing in Wisconsin are the broader implications on the overall 2020 election. But first, let's talk about what happened in Wisconsin so we have some background. As CNN reports, a divided Supreme Court said Monday that mail-in ballots in Wisconsin could be counted only if they are received by election day. Democrats in the state had asked the court to allow the counting of ballots that arrive up to six days after election day if they were postmarked by November 3rd. The ruling was 5-3, coming just before the Senate voted to add Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Now, you may be wondering, wait, didn't they just allow an extension in Pennsylvania? So what's the difference between Pennsylvania and Wisconsin? And it may seem arbitrary, but this distinction right here is huge the implications of this distinction and who buys into this difference here between these two states and why they ruled the way that they did is everything because it could determine the outcome of this election. Uh, so CNN explains, unlike the Pennsylvania order last week, the Wisconsin order Monday concerned a ruling from a lower federal court, not a state court. And Chief Justice John Roberts said that made a difference. A federal district court in Wisconsin had sided with the Democrats to allow mail-in ballots to be received up to six days after election day. But an appeals court blocked that order and the Supreme Court upheld the block. The federal district court, Roberts wrote in a concurring opinion, intervened in the thick of election season to block a state law. He said the case represented federal intrusion on state lawmaking processes. The Pennsylvania case, on the other hand, concerned a decision by the state's highest court. Roberts said that decision implicated the authority of state courts to apply their own constitutions to election regulations. Different bodies of law and different precedents govern these two situations and require in these particular circumstances that we allow the modification of election rules in Pennsylvania but not Wisconsin, Roberts wrote. Now, it doesn't necessarily make sense at face value, but journalist Mark Joseph Stern breaks down exactly why we have to read between the lines here, and specifically, we have to look at a footnote. And if we look at that footnote and we read what Kavanaugh is saying, all of this comes down to Brett Kavanaugh and Gorsuch using the logic that Ryan Quest used in Bush v. Gore. So he pointed this out. Holy shit, Brett Kavanaugh just endorsed Ryan Quest's concurrence in Bush v. Gore, which was too extreme for Kennedy or O'Connor. This is a red alert. I can't believe he put it in a footnote. This is terrifying. 
Now, he posts this really long block of text, but the most important part of this text is where Kavanaugh says this about the role of federal courts in elections. The answer to that question, as the unanimous court stated in Bush v. Palm Beach County canvassing, and as Chief Justice Reinquist persuasively explained in Bush v. Gore, is that the text of the Constitution requires federal courts to ensure that state courts do not rewrite state election laws. So this might seem benign, it might seem like it doesn't necessarily matter, but this could benefit Trump in a really huge way. Stern explains further, the headline news here is that by a 5-3 to three vote, SCOTUS made it harder for Wisconsin residents to cast a ballot and make sure it's counted. But arguably, the bigger news is that Brett Kavanaugh endorsed a theory so radical that the court refused to adopt it in Bush v. Gore. My God. Now, what he's referring to is the theory that federal courts must stop state courts from rewriting their state's election laws, their state legislatures to be exact, which wasn't necessarily intended to be present precedent during the Bush v. Gore ruling because it was that controversial because of the implications of it. I mean, it's just, it's too broad. It basically means that federal courts can technically stop state courts from protecting voter rights from a rogue legislature that is trying to actively carry out voter suppression. In the event of a legal dispute, a state court wouldn't necessarily be able to override what a state legislature wants because they're saying they can't rewrite election rules. So going back to that Florida example, if let's say it's close in Florida and Trump says, I want the state legislature and Ron DeSantis to send our own Republican electors that we can trust to the electoral college, even if Joe Biden got more votes. Well, obviously what would happen, Democrats would sue and that would land in the courts. A state court would likely side with Democrats in that instance and say, you can't do this, you're overriding the will of voters. And then the federal courts and the Supreme Court could come in and say, actually, these state courts don't get to determine what the state legislature wants. If the state legislature is saying that fraud was committed, these state courts don't get to control the election. They're literally using the logic that Reinquist used in Bush v. Gore. And assuming that Amy Coney Barrett agrees with Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, she would give Trump the advantage in this situation in the likely event this type of scenario landed in the courts. Now, Stern continues, this is very bad news for voting rights. Appallingly bad. Brett Kavanaugh used a footnote to throw his support behind an extreme theory that would severely limit state courts' ability to protect voting rights. It's the revenge of Bush v. Gore. Actually, it's much worse. How radical is Kavanaugh's theory? John Roberts felt compelled to reject it in a separate opinion, correctly noting that federal courts should keep their noses out of a state court interpretation of its own state's election laws. Roberts is now the moderate on voting rights, and he shares Roberts stating his concern for this federal intrusion on state lawmaking processes. Now, Gorsuch also endorsed Reinquist's position in Bush v. Gore, and Kavanaugh joined his opinion. Both want to prevent governors, state courts, and state agencies from expanding voting rights and have federal courts decide how the legislature really wanted elections to run. As fate would have it, I wrote about this exact issue in an article that published minutes before SCOTUS handed down this order. I urge you to read it because this is the next fight. It's already here. We're staring down the barrel of Bush v. Gore too. With Barrett's vote, the Supreme Court is poised to become a Supreme Board of Elections with freewheeling power to stomp on state courts that try to protect protect voting rights. What Kavanaugh and Gorsuch did tonight is a five alarm fire for democracy. And what he's saying here is something that we should all take seriously, because you have to understand how extreme this thinking is. State courts who are enforcing their state's constitution, if it has anything to do with elections, by definition, would be illegitimate and invalid if you use Ryan Quist's logic from Bush v. Gore, which Kavanaugh and Gorsuch do. Now, uh, Amy Coney Barrett once did do work on Bush v. Gore, as did Kavanaugh, and I believe Chief Justice Roberts as well. But even he sees that this, the implications are just so broad. You have to allow state courts to protect voting rights. Otherwise, are we just going to allow a state legislature to write arbitrary rules that disenfranchise thousands to millions of voters and, you know, the, these state courts can't do anything to prote protect them because a federal court will say, no, you have to let the state legislature decide. But the state court's role is to protect the constitution of their states. 
So this is insane. And there's really an endless amount of scenarios where this could benefit Donald Trump. So um, let's say that it's really close in a state like Florida, as we've been using that analogy, but we don't even have to go to the situation where Trump tries to send his own, you know, electors to the Electoral College. It could be something as simple as, you know, um, voters want a recount because it's really close. A state court can grant that, and then a federal court and the Supreme Court can come in and say, actually, no, you don't get to do that. There are so many ways that Trump is advantaged in this situation legally if they actually apply this logic here and understand the Supreme Court now doesn't have any chance that they're going to side with liberals because because even if uh, Justice Roberts jumps ship and sides with the liberals on the Supreme Court, conservatives now have a comfortable majority. At a minimum, it's going to be 5-4. So I'm not saying that we're going to see a Bush v. Gore situation. It could be a really quick election night where Joe Biden wins decisively and there's not much that Donald Trump can do to, uh, you know, delegitimize the election results. But if there's a chance, he's going to try to. And again, that tweet tells us he is already preparing to rat fuck this election. Big problems and discrepancies with mail-in ballots all over the USA must have final total on November 3rd understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to do exactly what his legal team told us he would do. He's already setting us up, conditioning us to believe we have to expect there to be discrepancies. So everyone has to be vigilant and cognizant of the possibilities here. I'm not saying this is definitely going to happen, but if Trump's legal team is already trying to find ways to rat fuck this election, then I think that we need to be prepared for them to try to do just that, especially since Donald Trump is citing uh, these types of claims. Oh, there's already discrepancies. This is not good. Um, not good at all. So we keep passing more and more grim milestones with regard to COVID-19. More than 220,000 deaths due to COVID-19. Record highs in new cases per day. As high as 85,000 new cases. So the situation is, um, it's bleak. And if Donald Trump wants to win this election, he's got to give us at least some assurance that going forward, he's going to be a little bit more competent. He's going to try to handle this as if there are some adults around him advising him to do the right thing. But unfortunately for Donald Trump, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows said the quiet part out loud and admitted basically that we're not going to try to do anything to control the virus. What do you want us to do? He actually admitted this in an interview on CNN with Jake Tapper. And it's astonishing that he'd say this a week before an election. And let me tell you the aftermath of what he said here. The fallout was just, it was huge. Uh, but first, let's watch and see what he had to say. On your website yesterday, Jake, yeah. your, you know, your website is talking about, well, now we think the spread is coming from small social groups and family groups. First, it was large groups. Now it's small groups. It's now coming from all now, sorts now, of places. Now, well, that's coming exactly, from all sorts of places that's because exactly the pandemic's the out of control. So, so here's what we have to do. We're not going to control the pandemic. We are going to control the fact that we get uh, vaccines, therapeutics, and other mitigation. Why are we going to get control of the because, pandemic? But because it is a contagious virus, just like the flu. Yeah, but why not it's make contag- efforts to contain it? Well, we are making efforts to contain it. By and, running and all over the country, not wearing a mask? Jake, that's what the vice president is doing. We can get doing. into the back, back and forth. Let, let me just say this is what we need to do is make sure that we have the proper mitigation factors, whether it's therapies or vaccines or treatments, to make sure that people don't die from this. But to suggest that we're going to actually quarantine all of America, I know lock down no our one, economy. No one's saying that. Well, that they are. Joe Biden's saying that. He says, lock everybody That's down. We're going to have, we're gonna have, a, not, dark, we're gonna have a dark winter. We're going to have a dark That's winter. what health officials say. That's well, what health officials say, no, that it's well, going to get worse. No, no we that's Joe Biden's re- days. Jake, Jake you, in let's terms be of honest. Let's, Friday let's, and Saturday. Let, the let's be honest days. here. The, the health officials did not say dark winter. Those were Joe Biden's words. He when was we look quoting at the, a health official. Uh, when, I think he was when, quoting when, William Hazeltine. When, when, when we look at the number of cases increasing, what we have to do is make sure that we fight it with therapeutics and vaccines, take proper medication factors in terms of social distancing, 
and mask when we can. And when we, when we look at this, what we're, we're going to defeat it, Jake, because what we are, we're Americans. We do that. And this president is leading while Joe Biden is sitting there Mark, suggesting that the, we're the going to mandate the president masks. Is wow. He literally took a jab at Joe Biden for wanting to mandate masks nationally. When we are dealing with a pandemic, a virus that's highly contagious, you mandate masks. You wear masks. That's, that's what you do. I mean, other countries, they don't have an issue with this. Trump hasn't been encouraging his supporters to wear masks. If anything, he's discouraged them. He has paid lip service to this idiotic idea that, you know, you can't mandate masks because that would violate people's liberty. Well, if you don't wear a mask, you're violating other people's liberty because don't people have the right to not have your disgusting germs spread on them? And to give you some context, uh, this interview, basically the entire time Jake Tapper was questioning him as to why Mike Pence, after people around him tested positive for COVID-19, he's still going out doing rallies, not wearing a mask. And what does he do? He says, one, we're not going to try to control it. And two, I think that Joe Biden wanting a national mask mandate, uh, that's bad. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I mean, you heard what he said. We're not going to control the pandemic. We are going to control the fact that we get vaccines, therapeutics, and other mitigation areas. So l let me tell you something. It's not like your administration is putting on lab coats and creating a vaccine yourself. Private companies are doing this. Johnson & Johnson is creating a vaccine. Other companies, uh, I mean, the U.S. government is funding them to a degree, sure, but it's not like the White House is creating this vaccine directly. So meanwhile, while the vaccines are being prepped, you have to take action to mitigate the spread. You can't just let it wash over America as Trump initially wanted to have happen. You have to try to contain it because a vaccine can only do so much. If you don't get it under control, then a vaccine alone will not suffice. We need a multitude of things, social distancing, and yes, a shutdown in certain states where it's spreading. Now, there are you know, economic implications if you shut down the economy of, uh, you know, a, a state a, a state or a city. And uh, small businesses will suffer. Yes, that's correct. But you, you do this intelligently. You don't just shut down that economy and leave small businesses and individuals out left to dry. You give them economic relief. That's why we need another stimulus, a UBI, more PPE, more loans for small businesses that we exclude large corporations from having access to. But you don't want to do that. But yet, you don't want there to be any negative economic repercussions because of the virus, which is why we have to open and pretend like it's not a thing and send kids back to school. But what they don't realize is that you don't get to pick and choose. If more and more people get the virus and they die, that's also going to have an impact on the economy. If people are afraid of the pandemic and the virus and they don't want to go out, that's going to hurt the economy. So you can't just not control it. You have to do what you need to do to get it under control. And sometimes that means you take swift action, severe action, and you shut down economies, but you don't leave them hanging. You give them assistance. Use the power of the purse of the federal government and make sure they don't go under if they have to shut down. But they don't want to do anything. They don't. They just don't care. Um, Tapper asked him, why aren't you going to get control of the pandemic? And he said, because it is a contagious virus, just like the flu. So there's nothing we can do. We just sit on our asses and uh, we pressure these private companies to hurry up and uh, get that vaccine out to us as soon as possible. Meanwhile, we're not going to do jack fucking shit. We're just going to pretend like it's not a thing and downplay it. Yeah. So um, expectedly, Joe Biden seized on this because Right before an election where the number one issue on Americans' minds is COVID-19, you don't say something like this. So Joe Biden hit him, and he hit him hard. Yesterday, the White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, went on television to admit to the country that the administration wasn't even trying, trying anymore to deal with the pandemic. He said, and I quote, we're not going to control the pandemic. The Washington Post headline today says it's White House gives up on trying to slow virus spread. No caveats, just a deadly admission. Early in this pandemic, some of you have had to cover me for a long time, called him, Trump called himself a wartime president, fighting the war against an invisible enemy. And I've been saying for months, as you well know, that he waved the white flag 
all the way back then. He wasn't doing much at all. Some people said I was being harsh, that I was being unfair. The White House was coming right out now and admitting what I said months ago was absolutely true. And look how many people are dead. 220,000. And it's expected as many as another 200,000 could die between now and the end of the year. And he said, we're not going to control it. Not going to control it. The bottom line is Donald Trump is the worst possible president, the worst possible person to try to lead us through this pandemic. Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden is right here, not just on the substance, but he's right to hit them on this strategically because this has been the strategy from day one. Donald Trump hasn't just been downplaying it, but he doesn't want to take it seriously. There was a report that the White House is hoping that Americans just grow numb to people dying from COVID-19 because they're not going to take any action because they don't want to hurt the economy. So we have to sacrifice your grandparents and your loved ones to the gods of capitalism because God forbid we shut down and give you know small businesses loans and give people a UBI. God forbid we do that. We have to make sure that we pretend like everything is normal because we don't want to hurt the economy. If you die, well, that's better than the economy dying. That's their logic. Um, now, of course, Mark Meadows was asked about this because there was a lot of fallout. So much so that Trump had to do damage control after Mark Meadows, his chief of staff, said this. Now, usually Trump will say something stupid and his staffers have to do damage control. But this time Trump had to do damage control. So he was asked about this when this blew up, because obviously if you admit that you're not going to try to control the virus, that's pretty controversial, I would say. Um, so basically what he did was he moved the goalpost and tried to make it not seem as bad. The only person waving a white flag along with his white mask is Joe Biden. I mean, when we look at this, we're going to defeat the virus. We're, we're not going to control it. We will try to contain it as best we can. And if you look at full context of what I was talking about is, is we need to make sure that we have therapeutics and vaccines. We may need to make sure that when people get sick, that that they have the kind of therapies that the president of the United States has that uh, we can provide those emergency use authorizations hopefully will be coming in very short order. So once again, he poked fun at Joe Biden for wearing a mask. I mean, this might play well with your base, but most Americans don't like when you say this because most Americans know that wearing a mask is essential if we want to contain the spread. I mean, do you know how quickly we'd get COVID-19 under control? If all Americans wore a mask, if we got 95% of Americans to wear a mask, how effective that would be at containing the spread. But he's saying, no, 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 we're not going to control it, but we will try to contain it. That's what control means. So what you're saying, it doesn't matter. It's a distinction without a difference. You said you're not going to control it. That's basically the same as you saying you're not going to contain it or try to contain it. And now that you see the backlash, now you're trying to move the goalpost, walk it back a little bit. But once the damage is done, like it's already done. And the thing that Mark Meadows doesn't realize is that it's not like this is surprising. This is what Americans had already suspected because Trump's administration has not taken this virus seriously. Uh, but Trump, after tooting his own horn repeatedly about how wonderful of a job he's done, didn't like what Mark Meadows said. And he said, no, 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 of course we're trying to control it. Like, what are you talking about? I want to win this election. So yeah, we're trying to control it, even though we're not. No, not at all. In fact, the opposite. Absolutely the opposite. We've done an incredible job. Take a look at what's happening in Europe. What's happening to Europe is uh, nobody's seen anything like it. And you used to tell me all about Europe. No, we're doing a great job. Uh, we are absolutely rounding the corner. Other than the fake news wants to scare everybody, we are absolutely rounding the corner. Go ahead. When you have Trump trying to do damage control for Mark Meadows, that's when um, <laughs> that's when you know they're in trouble, right? And uh, Trump actually took to Twitter to tweet about the wonderful job that he's doing just for good measure to make sure that we know he's doing a great job, guys. He says, we have made tremendous progress with the China virus, but the fake news refuses to talk about it this close to the election. COVID, COVID, COVID is being used by them in total coordination in order to change our great early election numbers. Should be an election law violation. Should be an election law violation. Really interesting. 
maybe, and this is just me, maybe the media isn't talking about the tremendous progress you've made with regard to COVID-19 because you fucked up at every single step along the way. And right now, this close to the election, we're seeing new spikes, dumbass. So why would they give you credit when the situation is worse? We're entering our second wave in most states when some states arguably aren't even out of the first wave. So why the fuck would we give you credit for that, you dumb bitch? Dumb bitch. Like, Trump is the dumbest human being on the planet. Um, but, I mean, he's still, you know, by making this tweet, you can tell that he's trying to um, get ahead of this narrative. Don't let Mark Meadows and what he said about them not wanting to control it be the thing that, um, you know, dominates the headlines. Trump wants to make sure that people think he's doing a good job, but that's just demonstrably false. Um, so, you know, I don't know how this is going to play. It might be too late to, to affect the election because I think most people with a brain know that Trump has botched this pandemic. It's been terrible. Um, but this could very well be the final nail in the Trump campaign's coffin because to say that this close to the election as numbers tick up, as deaths tick up, it's just political suicide at this point. All right, folks, so we've got to talk about something that happened um, over the weekend on Twitter, which is where I think 95% of all of the divisions and factionalizations along the left occurs. If there's any progressive infighting, usually it's happening on Twitter, uh, and this is no exception. So this is a bit of a controversial subject to even be discussing, but I think that it's worthwhile to talk about this because I, I feel like there is something happening on the left that to me, as someone who is a leftist, I find very disturbing. I, I think that we have to once in a while recenter ourselves and ask ourselves why we're so engaged, why we care about all of this in the first place. But first, let me give you the details. So Green Party presidential candidate Howie Hawkins took some shots at AOC via Twitter. So he tweeted out an interview that she did with Jake Tapper, where AOC explains how her disagreement with Joe Biden when it comes to the issue of fracking doesn't necessarily bother her. Uh, but, you know, she is going to try to lobby him should he become president. Now, Howie Hawkins responded to this saying, AOC has repeatedly refused to call for an immediate ban on fracking or a halt to new fossil fuels. She took my Green New Deal, added 20 years to the timeline, and stripped out our call for public ownership of our energy system and a massive cut in the military budget to pay for it. Now, when I saw this tweet, I felt, um... I felt discouraged because it seems to me that leftists have lost sight of what matters because Howie Hawkins and AOC are allies. She may be in the Democratic Party. He may be a member of the Green Party, but they are allies. So if I'm Howie Hawkins, I am a presidential candidate. Here's what I say if I think that maybe she has watered down the Green New Deal. Hey, AOC, let's talk about ways that we can improve the Green New Deal. I am the architect of the Green New Deal, and I have some disagreements with you. Let's talk about it. But what he does here is he accuses her of taking his Green New Deal, which is interesting. Now, first of all, I don't necessarily know that he's representing her position correctly because she has been against fracking from the very beginning just a couple of weeks ago during the vice presidential debate she tweeted out fracking is bad actually when kamala harris was saying joe biden is not going to ban fracking now that doesn't necessarily mean that aoc is above criticism i do think that it is healthy for leftists to debate one another um but i, I think that what he's saying here isn't necessarily correct because she drafted the green new deal not as a specific piece of legislation, but as a policy framework, as a blank slate to be filled in with the goal to meet the IPCC's 12-year deadline. So when he says that she added 20 years, he has to be more specific. But overall, like this doesn't, this doesn't seem helpful. I don't know how this is going to further dialogue among allies. But the worst thing to me is the accusation that she took the Green New Deal. Because do you want to know what I say to that? Good. If a politician who is very popular, who has a really large platform, takes an idea from, you know, a lesser known politician or political party, that's a victory. Because guess what? I don't care which politician passes a particular policy. I just care that that policy gets codified into law. 
Now, he can nitpick specific provisions about her iteration of the Green New Deal. I think that's perfectly leg legitimate. But to just say, oh, well, you took my Green New Deal. A piece of legislation, a policy solution is not like a song where, you know, this is your creative piece that you've written. And anytime someone mentions it, you get paid royalties. A solution is a solution. And, you know, if you believe she took your Green New Deal and that a Democratic Party politician shouldn't take anything that the Green Party comes up with, well, then isn't that a little bit hypocritical if you are making this argument? Because the New Deal is something that the Democratic Party originally came up with. This was FDR's policy. So if she can't take a Green Party policy, then why are you able to take a policy from FDR? That doesn't necessarily make sense to me. And so my question is, if you both agree on 95, 96, 97 percent of the policies, what is the point of this? What is the point of this infighting? Because you're angry that she took your policy? I mean, look, Ilhan Omar came up with her own piece of legislation uh, that cancels student debt. Do you want to know the first popular politician who came up with student debt cancellation? Jill Stein. I don't hear Jill Stein complaining that Ilhan Omar took her policy. And do you want to know who wouldn't care whether or not which politician stole an idea from another politician? The people who get their student loan debt canceled. That's who wouldn't care. And I'm sorry, but Howie Hawkins is polling at 0.5% nationally. A new poll that I saw today put him at 0%. So if you have zero name recognition, but you have good ideas... This is a victory for you if somebody else takes your idea and popularizes it. If the Democratic Party was smart, it would take the entire Green Party platform because they would be unstoppable. And do you want to know who agrees with me? Former Green Party presidential candidate Ralph Nader, who said the exact same thing. I think the Democrat Party should take the third party agenda away from it. They should have a living wage, just crack down on corporate crime, full Medicare for all. What do they uh, expect to do? Uh, they, they have the third party supposed to help them? A, a democracy is only a democracy if it has competitive elections, contested elections, not a two-party duopoly dialing for the mm. same corporate dollars. That, it is a First Amendment. That's where the political bigotry comes in. But you're right. There are a lot of other things. 300,000 Democrats in Florida in 2000 voted for Bush. Hmm. You're going to blame the Green Party for that? The Secretary of State and Jeb Bush shenanigans, you know all about that sure. with the ballot. You're going to blame the Green Party for that criminality? That's why I call it political bigotry. Democratic Party, stop, look, stop scapegoating, look in the mirror and ask yourself why you cannot landslide the worst the most ignorant, the most corporate indentured, the cruelest Republican Party in history. And he's right. If the Democrats were smart, they would copy and paste the totality of the Green Party platform because it's a great platform. So we have to stop for a moment and ask ourselves, at the end of the day, what are we here for? Why do we even care about all of this? Why, why do we stay engaged? Why do we care? It's because of the policies. It's because of the policies. And the left, to me, as of late, seems to be somewhat losing focus of the policies. And it's because we are eating ourselves alive. I mean, just from AOC's Twitch stream of Among Us, I saw, like, so many leftists brigade and just, like, criticize her. Because, you know, she is, she's supposed to be a politician. She's supposed to be fighting for us. She's not supposed to be treated like a celebrity. Okay, but, like, do you not want progressive politicians to be popular? Like, of course, we have to make sure that she stays humble and she stays committed. But as far as I know, she's still pretty fantastic, one of the best lawmakers in Congress. So we're mad that she's getting popular. It's like we, we build up politicians like AOC. We, we help get her elected. And as soon as she's elected, we break her down. Like, you have to understand, guys. This type of factionalization is not good for the left. And I say this as someone with enough self-awareness to acknowledge that I am also part of the problem. Like, we all fight each other. But we have to find a way to be united as leftists. Because if we stay divided, then guess who's going to win? The centrists and the fascists. So we can't let these petty things 
divide us. And I'm not saying this as someone who is, you know, attacking Howie Hawkins to defend AOC. I'm not a Green Party hater. I voted for Jill Stein in 2016. I defended the Green Party from the Democratic's effort to get them removed from the ballot a month ago. And on top of that, I posted an hour-long interview to this channel with Howie Hawkins himself, and I think he's a brilliant guy. I'm currently supporting Lisa Savage, a Green Party candidate in Maine. But guess what? Policy overrides everything. I don't care about politicians or political parties. I care about policies. Whatever is going to get us from point A to point B in terms of getting those policies passed, that's what I want. I don't care who does it. I don't care who steals the policy ideas. I don't care. I want Medicare for all. I want a Green New Deal. I want very specific policies. And the way that we get there doesn't matter. It just matters that we get there. I don't care if we get a Green New Deal but, you know, the proper politician who came up with the idea in the first place doesn't get credit. Should we try to credit that person? Well, of course we should. But I'm not going to tear down someone who's trying to take a good idea and popularize it because then we're just hurting our own, our own goals. Howie Hawkins and AOC are political allies, regardless if they want to acknowledge that or not. You agree on the policy, you're allies. So why do we divide ourselves? I mean, after 2016... It was already bad enough that you really started to see factionalization among the left. You had some people say, we have to pursue a third party option because we just can't take over the Democratic Party. It's not possible. You had some people saying we have to do both. You had some people saying um, we can only take over the Democratic Party. And that was like the start of factionalization. And within these factions, you see even more factionalization. So just take like the third party supporters. Now within the third party, uh, you know, um, proponents, you see factionalization to where you have some people saying, no, we've got to, we've got to build up the Green Party. You have others saying, no, we need a new People's Party. You have others saying, no, we don't need political parties. We need independence. And what I have to ask ourselves is, what are we doing this for? Are we doing this because we're committed to a specific strategy that we have to be proven right on? Or are we actually trying to get policies codified into law? And so we have to recenter ourselves and remind ourselves of that and ask ourselves, is the actions that we're taking, is the infighting helping us get closer to those goals? I mean, you see some leftists just like nonstop bash AOC, bash her like all the time. And she's not above criticism. I've criticized her because I don't like that she referred to Nancy Pelosi as mama bear. I, I want her to fight them. I want them... Uh, the Democratic Party establishment to actually feel repercussions for their actions and inaction. But having said that, though, you know, you don't build up people and then immediately break them down. I mean, hypothetically speaking, if we got a people's party actually viable and we got electoral reform and got them, you know, elected, how long until we, we break those people down who get into Congress too? Like, we have to ask ourselves, how do we actually achieve the goals that we want? And every once in a while, we just get too caught up in our own factionalization and our mini little like communities that we craft for ourselves online on Twitter and it's not helpful to the overall movement. A leftist is someone who supports the same policies that I support. Who supports social democracy or socialism. Like we have to know who our allies are. And so if the Republican Party out of the blue surprised me and said, I support Medicare for all, not going to be mad at them. That'll never happen, but I wouldn't be mad at them. I would want them to do that because, again, this is about policies. That's it. And so while we attack each other and then attack like the few politicians who are actually fighting for us for no good reason, it makes me feel incredibly discouraged because, I mean, what is the goal ultimately? And I think we all know what the goal is. It's that we all want the same thing. We all want policies. So what's the point of tearing each other down? Holding each other accountable is important, but that's different than just like needlessly shitting on people, especially like AOC. Like she's the target of leftists oftentimes. And again, she's not above criticism, but like you're, you're shitting on the one politician who's actually fighting when there are hundreds of other politicians in Congress who couldn't care less about you, who are further away from what you want. And so hold her accountable as an ally, as a leftist, but at the same time, don't lose focus on who the real enemies are, right? Don't turn away our own allies if they don't agree with us on 100% of things. Like, as Michael Brooks said, don't stand, but don't cancel. Like, we have to understand that politics is going to be a messy thing. We're not going to expect that everyone who we get elected to Congress is going to be 100% perfect. 
is going to meet all of our expectations. So, you know, the goal in making this video is for us to just like ask ourselves every once in a while, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And when I say, why are we doing this? The this that I'm referring to is fighting, trying to get ideas, you know, that we want codified into law. It's because we're right. We have the moral high ground. So don't let ourselves become so divided and factionalized that we're each in our own individual factions that are basically microscopic and have zero impact nationally speaking. The left is more strong when it's unified, when there is camaraderie among all leftists, ranging from communists to socialists to social democrats and even some liberals. We have to make sure that we don't let ourselves get bogged down by bullshit Twitter drama. Okay? Hold leftists accountable if they actually backtrack, if they actually move away from policies that we like. But if they are still your allies, if they're still committed to things that we want them to be committed to, let's just, like, not tear them down. It just, it doesn't make sense. So, this made me feel like, man, we're never going to get ahead. We're never going to win. This is why centrists and Republicans keep winning because you have like a Green Party presidential candidate attacking one of the few Democrats in Congress who actually agrees with the Green Party's agenda and is trying to make that agenda more popular. Like if we're attacking AOC, I mean, it just it doesn't make sense. Now, one more time, she's not above criticism. So if he has some genuine grievances about her Green New Deal and the way that she is trying to get that implemented, then I think that it is justified for him to reach out to her. But you do it from a place of like trying to get your mutual goals accomplished, not saying, oh, well, you, you took my Green New Deal. That's mine. You don't get to claim it. I mean, I don't care. At the end of the day, I don't give a shit. Support the policies that I want and I support you. That's as simple as that. It's official. In a 52 to 48 vote, the United States Senate has voted to confirm far-right extremist Amy Coney Barrett, solidifying the conservative majority on the Supreme Court for decades, most likely, because they now have a 6-3 majority. And the only Republican to vote against Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation is Susan Collins, who likely would have voted with her party if she wasn't currently in a very competitive race for re-election where she is losing. So the implications of this are absolutely horrifying, and anyone who actually cares about progress and maintaining the progress that we've made, even the incremental steps we've taken to make this country a little bit more equitable, you should be worried right now, because everything's on the chopping block, starting with the Affordable Care Act. So that means if you are under 26 and you're currently on your parents' plan or you're in a state where you benefit from the Medicaid expansion or you signed on to one of your state's exchanges and you bought overpriced health care, but it's, it's health insurance nonetheless, you may lose what you have. It was a small step in the right direction, but you can't even keep that. If you are a woman who cares about your bodily autonomy, we may lose that. If you know a loved one who is LGBTQ+, well, uh, same-sex couples, their marriages will be on the chopping block. And if Obergefell v. Hodges gets overturned, that means it's going to be up to the states, which means that lots and lots of red states will immediately undo marriage equality. And this isn't hypothetical. This is what the Republican Party has said they want to do. They want to appoint Supreme Court justices who will not just rip down the ACA, but overturn marriage equality and abortion. So for more details on this, we go to the Washington Post. It reports the vote was 52 to 48 for Barrett, President Trump's third nominee to the Supreme Court. The 48-year-old jurist solidifies a judicial legacy for the White House and Senate Republicans that also includes dozens of younger and more ideologically conservative judges to the federal appeals courts. An acolyte of the late Justice Antonin Scalia, Barrett is certain to diverge dramatically from the woman she will succeed. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died September 18th and was for decades an enduring icon for liberals. The battle to confirm Barrett, whose installation occurred as more than 60 million people had already cast their ballots for president, also plunged a Senate already bruised by years of tit-for-tat skirmishes in the judicial wars into deeper partisan acrimony. In sense, Democrats charged Republicans with hypocrisy for blocking President Barack Obama's Supreme Court nominee for eight months in 2016 and repeatedly pointed out that no justice has been confirmed this close to a 
presidential election, but Republicans asserted their raw power, muscling Barrett's nomination through in just over four weeks and with no bipartisan support, the first time that has occurred for a Supreme Court nominee in generations and a reflection of the politicized atmosphere around judicial fights. Her intellectual brilliance is unquestioned, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said of Barrett on Sunday. Her command of the law is remarkable. Her integrity is above reproach. The White House planned an outdoor ceremony after the vote Monday to celebrate her confirmation and Justice Clarence Thomas was expected to administer the constitutional oath. Supreme Court justices take two oaths, one to protect and uphold the Constitution and another about judicial conduct. Once sworn in, Barrett will solidify a 6-3 to three conservative majority on the court and will be in a position to immediately hear contentious cases on elections and health care. So that's that. Uh, she was confirmed after Republicans said, we don't confirm new Supreme Court justices in an election year. They did just that. And Democrats went right along with it, putting up barely any fight whatsoever, uh, assisting them in some cases, if we're talking about Dianne Feinstein. And I've got to show you this um, very strongly worded letter that Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer put out via Twitter, because I'm sure that this is going to persuade so many Republicans. He says, today will go down as one of the darkest days in the Senate's 231 year history. The Senate GOP is thwarting the will of the people and confirming a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court in the middle of a presidential election. Democrats will never stop fighting for Americans. You guys literally just stops fighting as this process plays out like what did you do to stop it what procedural tools did you try to use did you like even try to put up any bit of a fight besides like tweeting about it what did you do you are in power and you didn't do anything and now guess what we're all fucked so the only way we have a chance in hell of undoing the damage that Amy Coney Barrett will inevitably cause is if we get serious about packing the supreme court and any democrat who is currently in Congress or in the Senate, who is not actually willing to do this, has to be replaced immediately. Now, uh, Joe Biden was asked about whether or not he'd be open to term limits, since Amy Coney Barrett is young and can serve for decades, and he already shot down that idea. Um, so Democrats just, <laughs> they're so weak that they had an opportunity, a short window to act, and I just saw them basically give up and concede. But here's what we have to do. Replace any Democrat who doesn't want to do the following things. We expand the Supreme Court. At a minimum, we add two more justices since conservatives stole two, Brett Kav or uh, Justice Gorsuch and Amy Coney Barrett. I don't necessarily view Kavanaugh as a stolen seat, but nonetheless, we have to absolutely expand the number of justices. Now, if you ask me, we add six, expand the number to 15 justices, and then we secure a liberal majority. Now, you can say, well, Mike, if we do that, then that just means that conservatives, when they take back the Senate, they're going to expand the Supreme Court as well. And I sympathize with that argument. In fact, Ted Cruz is already saying that's what he wants to do. But here's the thing, even if both parties go tit for tat whenever they take back control of the Senate and we keep expanding the number of justices on the Supreme Court. What is more preferable to you? That instance where there are periods of conservative majorities and liberal majorities over the next few decades or a constant period of conservative rulings with Amy Coney Barrett and their 6-3 majority? You see, at least if we go tit for tat, we get some breaks in there. But if we don't do anything, we don't expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court, then what happens? then we just have non-stop conservative rulings. Just irreparable harm to democracy. The progress that we already made. We have to refight those battles. Gay marriage, abortion. Do you really want to go back and fight those battles when we're dealing with a climate catastrophe? When people are falling into poverty and we need to take action to make progress, not fight to regress further backwards? I mean, what do you want to do? I say we expand the court and um, if Republicans want to add more justices too, fine, we will go tit for tat. Whenever Democrats have a president and the U.S. Senate, we expand the court, add more justices. But what we do is we stop them from expanding the number of justices. And we do that by expanding democracy. So that means immediately, if Democrats are able to take control of the Senate, the first thing that they do is they make D.C. a state. Then they allow Puerto Ricans to vote for statehood. That's four more senators. We add Guam. We add any U.S. territory to the nation. 
And um, if Republicans don't like that we're doing that, if they think it looks like a really cheap political maneuver, well, they're the ones who have to argue against democracy. They're the ones who have to explain why further enfranchising more people uh, is actually a bad thing. They're arguing against democracy, so let them make that case. Um, they may try to do that as well. They may try to uh, carve up Texas and other red states in order to basically create a Senate that looks more favorable to Republicans. Okay, well then we'll do that too. We'll carve up California. Uh, on top of that, we make sure we make voting compulsory and re reduce all barriers to voting because Republicans know that if more people participate in democracy, they lose every single election because this is a minority party. So it's not like we're rigging the system. We're making the system literally more democratic. So they have to compete. They have to appeal to people in these new states that we can create to the new voters who are forced to vote now because they have no choice. So there's no time to just like sit around and uh, mope about all of this and think, oh man, well, this sucks, but it's going to happen. They're going to repeal Roe v. Wade. Nope. Democrats have to have a plan. And it's really important now that we get them to first show their cards so we know where they stand. Because the Democrats who come out against court packing are the first ones that we have to target going into 2022. Anyone who's up for re-election that doesn't support court packing, they've got to go. Sorry. We can't deal with 20 to 30, possibly 40 years of a conservative majority where all of the progress we've made, even though it's not that much, over the past uh, half a century... All gets undone. We're looking at a Lochner era on steroids. So we just, we, we don't have time for that. We don't have time to go backwards. We have to keep moving forward. And so we don't have a choice. Democracy is at stake. So we have no choice but to expand the Supreme Court. Republicans are the ones that did this. They basically instituted their own court packing plan. They're not expanding the number of justices, but they're using dirty tricks that aren't necessarily unconstitutional, but they are dirty. So if they're going to play that way, Democrats have to play that way too. Fight fire with fire. Don't participate in asymmetric warfare. Fight back. Now, a lot of them will not fight back, but I do like what I see from some senators, such as Brian Schatz, uh, Ed Marquis, uh, even Angus King are talking about maybe actually doing uh, something that looks like either term limits for Supreme Court justices or court packing. Because when things get this bad, where all the progress that activists have fought for for decades is going to be overturned like that, one case after another after another, you have no choice. You know, I find it really interesting that Mitch McConnell, he refused to allow a vote on another stimulus package. The Democrats passed the HEROES Act in the House months ago. He won't even allow a vote on that. And it's imperfect. It's not good enough, but it's something. Right now, Americans need anything. They can't put food on the table. They're getting evicted. You need to give them some relief. Wouldn't take that up. He wouldn't even take up Donald Trump's $1.8 trillion proposal, down from $2.2 trillion that Nancy Pelosi was proposing. I repeat... The Republican Senate Majority Leader would not take up the Republican President's stimulus package after the Republican President publicly said, I want to pass this, this package. But he had time, of course, to rush through a far-right Supreme Court nominee, confirm that individual one week before this election to make sure that his corporate donors got exactly what they wanted. And it just goes to show you that this is asymmetric warfare. Now they're going on recess while the American people are just being left out to dry. So the Republican Party is playing as dirty as they possibly can play, using every single procedural tool at their disposal, being as openly hypocritical as is humanly possible. And it's time that Democrats actually fight fire with fire which is why they have to make sure that their number one priority if they take back the Senate is court packing. And I know that some of them are not on board, including uh, Democrats that I uh, like, or I should say independents that I like, such as Bernie Sanders. He's not necessarily been open to ending the filibuster and packing the Supreme Court. Not acceptable. Nobody is allowed to uh, not accept this because we can't afford to have three to four decades worth of non-stop conservative rulings and undo what little progress we've made. So whoever isn't on board 
is going to have to get on board because we don't have a choice. Otherwise, we are allowing the Republicans to wage asymmetric warfare, not just on the Democratic Party, but on the country itself. Now, some Democrats are starting to vocalize openness, if not outright an endorsement of court packing. Ed Markey tweeted out, end the filibuster and expand the Supreme Court. That is exactly what I want to hear every single U.S. senator say. Now, I think that they're going to play coy whenever this question is brought up before the election. But the day after that election, I better start hearing a firm plan to pack the court. Term limits, expand the court. I don't know, but you can't just allow there to be a 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court and watch all of the civil rights and civil liberties that activists fought for for decades to just be overturned like that. Not acceptable. So you've got to fight. And that means you fight fire with fire. So Ed Markey is right on the money here by explicitly saying, we're going to pack the court now. Sorry, uh, Republicans packed the court. So we have no choice. We have to do that as well. Now, even someone who I wasn't expecting to be open-minded about this is starting to change his tune a little bit. Independent Angus King. And as Sahil Kapoor of NBC News reports, Senator Angus King of Maine on the Senate floor tonight said, I don't want to pack the court. I don't want to change that number. I don't want to have to do that. But if all of this rule breaking is taking place, what does the majority expect? What did they expect? They expect that we are going to be able to break the rules with impunity. And when the shoe is maybe on the other foot, nothing is going to happen. The people over here are going to say, oh, well, we can't change the rules. One of the things that's amazed me since I've come here is how people feel they can do things to one another and never have it have any consequences, never have it come back on them. The shoe may be on the other foot. We don't know what's going to happen next week. So that right there is really big. He's saying... You guys are playing dirty, so maybe it's time we play dirty as well. Now, on top of that, Brian Schatz is uh, starting to use rhetoric that might suggest that he's becoming a little bit more open to the idea. So he tweeted out his speech from the Senate floor, and he added, The old Senate has been destroyed. We need to build something better. So what we're starting to see now is some really small signs that some Democrats are actually going to fight possibly we'll have to see and it's incumbent on us to hold them accountable but we're seeing some signs of life signs that maybe they're finally willing to fight because the republican party has proven that it is ruthless they will do whatever they have to do to make sure they get what they want so it's time you start fighting as well um, now, there's going to be a number of senators who are not going to budge on this. Dianne Feinstein is one of them. Now, she's not up for re-election until 2024. Does that mean we just give her a pass? No. If she's not going to budge on this, there should be a tremendous amount of effort, grassroots pressure, for her to resign. Because we just don't have time to wait until 2024. Democrats, if they take back the Senate, we have to assume they're going to have a very small window to act. They'll have the Senate for two years. We can't wait for stubborn senators to maybe lose their re-election campaigns. We don't have time. And in fact, there's already grassroots pressure for Chuck Schumer to commit to expanding the Supreme Court. Because as Ryan Grimm tweets out, more than 20 New York progressive elected officials are calling on Schumer to commit to expanding the Supreme Court. Schumer is up for re-election in 2022. This looks like a shot across the bow. And that's what I want to see. We don't have a choice. Now I'm going to make the same argument that I've been making in all of my videos where we talk about court packing because I want Democratic Party loyalists, leftists, everyone to get this through their head. We don't have a choice. The argument that Bernie Sanders used, he said, look, I don't want to do anything to expand the Supreme Court because what is that going to lead to? We add a couple justices, then Republicans are going to add a couple justices. Do we really want to go tit for tat? And um, my answer is yes. We try not to go tit for tat, but it's better than the alternative. If we do nothing and we do not expand the Supreme Court, what happens? We have 30 to 40 years of nonstop conservative rulings. But if we add some justices and have a liberal majority and then Republicans add more justices and have a conservative majority, at least there's going to be periods where there are liberal majorities, some good decisions. 
inaction means conservative rulings 100% of the time. And court packing, even if Republicans go tit for tat, means once in a while there will be some good rulings still. So even if Republicans end up packing the court too, again, we have no choice. 30 years of Republican rulings is just not acceptable. We can't allow all the fights that we already won to be rehashed. We just can't allow that. Now, of course, Democrats have to take action to stop Republicans from expanding the court as well. So what do we do? We make sure that it's really difficult for them to win elections. And we don't do that by resorting to voter suppression as they would do. We actually further enhance democracy, consolidate democracy, and make sure that more people have voices. We do the opposite of what they want to do, what individuals like Ted Cruz want to do. He wants a constitutional amendment to block Democrats from ever expanding the court. But what Democrats have to do is they actually have to be savvy. They have to immediately make sure that D.C. is a state because that is two more senators that will most likely be Democrats. Then you extend statehood to Puerto Rico. You allow them to vote because self-determination is important. Um, if they join, maybe entice them to join. That's two more Democratic senators most likely. Allow Guam, other U.S. territories to become states. And if Republicans don't like that and they say... Well, you're just making it so that way, you you know, you further tip the balance of the Senate in your favor. They have to make that anti-democratic argument. They have to argue against democracy. We're enfranchising people. We're making more people's voices heard. Are you really against that? Now, they can play dirty here, too. They can try to take red states and carve them up, like Texas, so that way they get more senators as well. Then we have to start playing even dirtier. Carve up California and other blue states like New York to make sure that we keep the balance of the Senate in Democratic control. And if they want to win, they've got to actually appeal to more people. They can't just bank on winning elections by suppressing the vote and doing voter suppression. But on top of that, we have to make sure we stop them from doing voter suppression. We are basically taking a radical democracy approach. So what we do is institute compulsory voting. We require people to vote. Every single person has to vote. Now, I don't care what you do to entice people to vote. You can use the carrot or the stick approach. I would prefer the carrot approach to where you're required to vote by law. And if you don't vote, you are not eligible for a particular tax credit of some sort. I don't know. Figure it out. Um, and what I would also say is that since the options typically in our system are garbage, we um, make sure that there is a none of the above option so people have to vote. But still, even if there's a none of the above option, people who are forced to come out to vote will most likely vote against Republicans because Republicans are a minority party with very unpopular ideas. So if everybody votes, if 100% of the population votes, even 95% of the population votes, Republicans know when turnout is high, they lose. So you stop them from winning by enhancing democracy. And if they don't like that, they have to make the anti-democratic case. They have to tell us and explain to us why enhancing democracy is a bad thing. They have to explain to us why further enfranchising more Americans, giving statehood to more states, is a bad thing. Why? Because they'd have to actually appeal to people and they can't just be openly fascist anymore? Oh no. So we don't have a choice. And I've said this once, I will say it every time we talk about court packing. Democrats have to do this. They don't have a choice. And as leftists, we absolutely have to pressure them with everything that they've got to where if they're not going to, you know, uh, explicitly support court packing, they've got to go. They've got to be primaried. If Chuck Schumer's not going to budge, we're going to have to primary him with AOC. We've got no fucking time for this. So, um... We've got to be ruthless, at least as ruthless as the Republicans, at least as ruthless as Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump. We don't have to be hypocritical like them. We don't have to suppress the vote and be undemocratic. But the way that we win and stop them from winning is by being more democratic. So we expand the court. We have no choice. You know, I sure am glad that I'm not a Senate Republican right about now because whew, these Senate Democrats are warning them 
since they decided to rush through this illegitimate far-right Supreme Court nominee, there is going to be hell to pay. They're going to pay a price for this. They're going to regret this. So uh, what are Senate Democrats going to do to make them regret this? Fuck all. That's what. Fuck all. Nothing. Because they're not proposing any sort of plan. Some Senate Democrats are actually talking tough and specifically saying, we're going to kill the filibuster and expand the Supreme Court. Most Senate Democrats are not saying that. Now, maybe it's the case that they're playing coy until the election. I think that maybe they're holding their cards a little bit close to their chest. That's reasonable to assume, right? Uh, but they haven't proposed any real plan and the things that they're saying, it really tells us what we're in for. They will do nothing. But yet they're telling Republicans that uh, they're they're going to pay. So so what are they going to do specifically? Well, this article from The Hill, uh, written by Jordan Carney, lays it all out. Democratic senators are warning that Republicans will regret confirming Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court as the Democrats face pressure from the left to nix the filibuster and expand the court if they win back the majority. Okay, great. So uh, what are they what are they saying specifically? Quote, I know that there's a lot of speculation about what Democrats will do if Democrats are given control of the Senate. Will Democrats go to new extraordinary lengths to maximize their power, given the extraordinary lengths Republicans have gone to maximize their power? Well, this is not a conversation that is ripe enough yet. <laughs> what do Republicans expect? Asked Senator Chris Murphy. Uh, quote, do we just unilaterally stand down and not choose to use the same tools that Republicans did in the majority? I think there are now new rules in the Senate, and I think Republicans have set them, he added. Okay. Uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, in a statement after Barrett's confirmation on Monday night, warned that Republicans will, quote, rue the day. <laughs> so stupid and corny with this vote my republican colleagues forfeit their right to call procedural fouls white house said "Ooh, i'm sure that they're terrified top senate democrats haven't said what they will do if they are back in the majority in january with senate minority leader chuck schumer saying everything is on the table as he tries to keep his party unified heading into the november 3rd election schumer however warned on monday night that republicans may have long-term regrets about their strategy. I doubt that. The Republican majority is lighting its credibility on fire. I'm sure that'll resonate with them. The next time the American people give Democrats a majority in this chamber, you will have forfeited the right to tell us how to run that majority, Schumer said. Oh no. Uh, my colleagues may regret this for a lot longer than they think. Mm, doubt. Senator Dick Durbin, Schumer's number two, agreed that Republicans would, quote, regret the consequences of taking the Senate down this path. So right out of the gate, even if they are holding their cards close to their chest and they're waiting to say anything until they see what the election results are, it's just so clear that they don't know how to play politics. They'll rue the day. They lit their credibility on fire. They're definitely going to regret this. How? How are you going to make them pay? What are you going to do to make them regret this? Be specific. I know they're going to write some more strongly worded letters and tweets and ask to speak to the Republican Party's manager. <laughs> Chuck Schumer is going to uh, pull down his glasses like this and he's going to look Mitch McConnell right in the eye and he's going to say, shame on you. Shame on you, sir. And then Mitch McConnell's going to laugh. <laughs> No, no, no. I know what they're going to do. Joe Biden, he's going to get elected. They're going to take back the Senate. And Joe Biden is going to commit to court packing. But there's a catch. Uh, rather than just adding six liberal justices to the Supreme Court, he adds three liberals and three Republicans. So that way, he did what the left wanted technically and expanded the size of the Supreme Court. But at the same time, he still makes sure that Republicans have that comfortable majority. I'm laughing uh, when I acknowledge this is not a laughing matter, but the Democratic Party is beyond parity. And trust me when I say they're not just going to willingly expand the court. That's not going to happen. We have to force them to do that. That's going to be tough. It's a pandemic. You know, mass resistance, protests, that's not something a lot of people want to do, but we have to flood 
their phones. We have to make sure we do everything in our power to force them to fight because they have just rolled over and died. I mean, Trump got three Supreme Court justices. Look at how hard Republicans fought to stop Democrats from getting a majority on the Supreme Court. Mitch McConnell held open a Supreme Court seat for months. And now he rushed through one right before an election. And the best that you got is they're going to rue the day? How? What are you going to do? Are you actually going to kill the filibuster and expand the court? Are you going to add more states to the union so you have more Democratic senators? Are you going to make voting compulsory and, you know, stop voter suppression? What specifically are you going to do? So, you know, it's early. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, even though, spoiler alert, they're going to fuck this up. This is a feckless party. They are one of the worst opposition parties ever. I mean, if you look to um, democracies around the world, like Turkey, uh, you don't really see the rise of dictatorship or illiberal democracy unless all of the factors are in place for that to happen. You know, radicalization, desperation among the population, but most importantly, an ineffectual opposition party. That's exactly what Democrats are. They haven't just enabled Donald Trump and Republicans throughout the years. They have been complicit a lot of the time. So, you know, what they're saying now, I just, they're like all bark and no bite. And they're not even bark most of the time. Like, look at the confirmation hearings when Dianne Feinstein was basically, you know, she had her nose up Amy Coney Barrett's asshole the entire time and thanked Lindsey Graham and hugged him and exposed herself to COVID-19. I mean, I, I just... We have to expect the worst, and we can never assume that Democrats are going to just automatically do the right thing because they are cowards, they are feckless. So we have to make sure that if they take back the Senate, we make their lives a living fucking hell unless they listen to the left and they cave. Because they got us into this mess. So the best they can do is have a little bit of courage, just a little bit, and try to get us out of this mess. But... The prognosis, not great, based on what we're seeing now. I am not afraid of Donald Trump. I am not afraid of the Republicans. And we're going to hold their feet to the fire. I am actually excited. Judge Amy Coney Barrett confirmed in record time. We already talked about Donald Trump's tweet where he falsely claims that he's already seeing some problems and discrepancies with mail-in ballots, also claiming that we must see the total vote on November 3rd. Uh, now he's saying that if we don't actually get the final results, see all of the votes totaled by November 3rd, that that may actually be illegal. It would be very, very proper and very nice if a winner were declared on November 3rd instead of counting ballots for two weeks which is totally inappropriate, and I don't believe that that's by our laws. I don't believe that. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe, it's perfectly legal, and the only reason why he's saying this is because he's trying to stack the deck in his favor. So if most of his supporters come out to vote in person, and most people uh, voting for Democrats come through mail-in ballots, maybe he gives himself a little bit of an advantage. But ask yourself this, why do we even see uh, winners declared on election nights at all? Does that mean that they declare a winner when the total vote has been counted? No. They declare a winner because data analysts at these large networks, they basically uh, make a prediction. It's, you know, an intelligent prediction, but it is a prediction nonetheless. They say, we predict that this person wins because assuming that, you know, California goes to the Democrat and uh, Alabama goes to Republicans, then with these states, now that we know who won or we know who appears to win in the state, we can say that this person reached that magic 270 number. So with mail-in ballots, this complicates things. We're in a pandemic. So to make this demand, like, 
It is very obvious what he's trying to do. And for more on this, we go to Common Dreams, who explains it is, in fact, perfectly legal for states to count ballots for weeks after the election. Some states allow mail-in ballots to arrive up to two weeks after November 3rd, as long as they are postmarked by Election Day. Due to the unprecedented surge in mail-in voting sparked by the pandemic, the process of tallying ballots and determining the election winner is expected to take longer than usual. Progressive critics and election analysts have long been warning of a nightmare scenario in which Trump falsely declares himself the winner on November 3rd based on an early lead in in-person votes and proceeds to declare all votes counted after Election Day illegitimate. The president's comments Tuesday bolstered those fears. Donald Trump is planning to do everything he can to make sure your vote doesn't count. Progressive advocacy group Indivisible, part of a coalition planning mass protests should Trump attempt to steal the election, set in response to the president's remarks Tuesday, which came hours after the conservative-dominated U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the battlegrounds of Wisconsin cannot extend its election day deadline for the arrival of mail-in ballots. In his concurring opinion in the case, Trump-nominated Justice Brett Kavanaugh parroted the president's attack on the common state practice of counting ballots that arrive after election day, a possible indication that Kavanaugh is, as Slate's Mark Joseph Stern put it, open to stealing the election for Trump. The implications of Kavanaugh's reason could reach beyond Wisconsin. As Stern pointed out on Twitter, North Carolina Republicans are already citing Kavanaugh's argument to justify their own push for the Supreme Court to limit the state's absentee ballot deadline. Brett Kavanaugh's stunning opinion last night should be a huge story today, said Stern. It casts aspersions on mail ballots. It's riddled with errors. It endorses a theory too radical for the Bush v. Gore majority. It's a preemptive attack on our elections in integrity. So what we see is Donald Trump, the right-wing Supreme Court, and Republicans across the country currently laying the groundwork to steal this election by making sure that any votes that come in after election day are invalid, disenfranchising potentially millions of Americans who don't want to risk their lives by voting in person because of the pandemic. But now, since Trump is doing this, he's basically forcing people, if they want to make sure that their votes get counted on election day, to vote in person. I mean, this is just, it's despicable. Even if Donald Trump isn't able to steal the election, what he's doing here by basically forcing people's hands, getting them to vote in a pandemic when mail-in voting is an option in their states, it's just... It's morally reprehensible because he wants to steal this fucking election. Like anyone who supports this and votes for him. They have to admit they don't care about democracy. If you are supporting a president who is saying all votes that come in after midnight on November 3rd are invalidated automatically because they're late, just admit you don't care about democracy. You want to live in a dictatorship. Because it is not under anyone's control if they mail in their ballot even though they get it filled out before the third and it doesn't arrive on time. That's not something that they can control. So because Donald Trump is impatient at best and wanting to steal the election at worst, we have to invalidate those ballots? This is just... It's infuriating. Just when you think Trump can't get any lower, be any more outrageous, he does the unthinkable. So this is him and Republicans trying to make sure, get all their ducks in a row to steal this election. Now, we've already talked at length about the plethora of things Trump's legal team can do to actually steal this election. And now that he has the federal judiciary and the Supreme Court on his side unequivocally, he can get away with remaining in power even if he doesn't win this election outright. We're not just talking about the popular vote. We are talking about him even losing the Electoral College but rat-fucking this election so individual states controlled by Republicans can get their own electors to vote for Donald Trump, even if their state sides with Biden, votes for Biden. So this election, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm bracing for disaster. I'm preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best. If Joe Biden wins decisively, then all of our fear fears are unwarranted. But um, we have to be prepared. I would rather over-prepare and be, you know, over-worried then not be prepared for something like this. But if this happens, then this really is an attack on democracy directly. And Republicans will get away with it. 
With less than one week until the big election, Donald Trump is now doing everything in his power to make sure that he ekes out a victory. So he is holding lots of rallies this week and probably spreading COVID-19 um, a lot. But, you know, you'd think that if you're a president and you want to be reelected, now is the time to make your pitch to voters. Any last holdouts that you need to win over, you have to explain to them very clearly what you're going to do to them. Trump is not doing that, however. These rallies are just him freestyling about random things, uh, joking, talking about how he's safe now, he may be immune to COVID-19, he wants to kiss the men and the women in the crowd, he says this all the time. I don't understand it, uh, but it's a cult, so I don't have to understand it because anything that he says by definition is good because whatever Dear Leader says is gospel to these people. Uh, but anyways, you know, not everyone is in Trump's cult. But there are people who he can still win over. So what does he do? Well, rather than trying to make a pitch to them, he attacks Ilhan Omar out of the blue with an attack that is so deranged and unhinged, once again, he may be putting her life at risk. Take a look. A 700% increase in refugees from the most dangerous terror hotspots on the planet, including Syria, Somalia. You know, when I think of Somalia, I think of Omar. Omar. Ilhan. Ilhan Omar, who truly does not like our country. You know, we are going to win Minnesota because of Omar. Because of Omar. She likes telling us what we should do, how we should run our country. Isn't that nice? Omar, no, we're going to win. She hates our country. And we're going to win also because the National Guard went in. You must should have been called a lot sooner. But the National Guard went into Minneapolis, and it was a beautiful sight. It took, what, 22 minutes? It was over. After a week and a half of destroying Minneapolis. So I think between Ilhan Omar, Ilhan Omar, and be and really what happened with respect, we stopped it. They should have called us a week and a half early. We're going to win. Minnesota. First time since, think of that. First time. I don't, want to, I don't want to guarantee. I don't want to guarantee anything. I'm a little bit superstitious. But I want to tell you, they like us. They like us in Minnesota. And how, to, and how the hell she gets elected, I cannot understand it. She's getting elected because she actually offers voters something unlike you. You offer your corporate donors a lot. So that's why they pay money to get you elected. But Ilhan Omar, she actually gives people something to believe in. Medicare for all. So Americans don't die if they don't have health insurance. Student debt cancellation. She is the sponsor of the House legislation that would wipe out all of our student debt. What are you doing, Donald Trump? What are you promising us? More fascism? More authoritarian crackdowns on the First Amendment? If we decide to protest because you refuse to do anything about police brutality? I mean, how can you not see it? How can you not see why she's popular? She stands for something. You stand for yourself. Now, what he says here is just despicable. So he's talking about refugees coming from, quote, the most dangerous terror hotspots. And then, of course, he names Ilhan Omar, which implies that she is either a terrorist or associated with people who are terrorists. Like, we know what he's doing. He's priming people, probably inadvertently, to think of Ilhan Omar and terrorists. Um, he says, she truly does not like our country. She's like telling us what we should do, how to run our country. She hates our country. So the way that he talks about Ilhan Omar, it's as if this isn't her country as well. This is his country. White America's country. How dare this refugee come to our country and tell us what to do here? This is not even dog whistle racism. This is explicitly racist. This is overt xenophobia. And by lumping her in, in the same conversation with regions where terrorism is prominent, where terrorist refugees come from, you are putting her life in danger. She already sees death threats continuously, puts up with more harassment and abuse than any other lawmaker. And you're making things worse because randomly at a rally, you want to attack her. Attack one of the few politicians who actually gives a damn about the American people. 
This is more her country than it is your country. I bet she pays more taxes than you. She wants to help out more Americans than you. You want to help out yourself. But the way that he pictures it, I mean, the language that he's using, it's as if he wants a white ethno state. I mean, this is our country. You don't get to tell us what we do in our country. And to anyone who listens to this and isn't immediately repulsed and turned off, either you are, at a minimum, okay with this, this type of explicit white supremacy, or you embrace it and you agree with him. You think that people like Ilhan Omar should be excluded, shouldn't be part of Congress, shouldn't be part of the lawmaking process, shouldn't have a say in how we run our country, we being white Americans, the white ones only, not the black ones, not the brown ones, not the immigrants. That's what he's saying. So if you vote for him, congratulations. You're a terrible human being. Now, he also talked about how beautiful it was when the National Guard came in and crushed protests that erupted after George Floyd was murdered. Now, keep in mind that Americans, the majority of them approved of them burning down a Minneapolis police station because they felt like that pain and anger was justified. Everyone was angry. But Trump is saying when the National Guard came in and crushed those protests, that was beautiful. This is fascism. When you crush your opposition, that by definition is fascism. He's not trying to stop the protests that he doesn't want by trying to meet with some of the leaders, black leaders, civil rights leaders, about how to reform police departments to stop police brutality. He's just trying to silence them. He's a disgusting fucking human being. Scum. Now, Ilhan Omar responded saying, it's surreal that an unhinged president of the United States would repeatedly say my name at his cult rallies, or that Americans would even elect someone like him. 24 years ago, if someone told my father when we arrived as refugees, he would have advised them to seek help, vote. Yeah, and that's just it. Um, you know, it, it's shocking that Americans elected someone like Donald Trump. You know, for how disappointed I've been in this country, like, it's still shocking that Trump is the president. Someone who is openly a fascist, openly white supremacist, uses the same exact rhetoric that we'd hear from people who advocate for a white ethno state. It's indistinguishable from the people chanting, you know, um, Jews will not replace us at Charlottesville. It's the same thing. How dare this brown immigrant tell us how to run our country, white Americans, we know what we're doing. Same fucking rhetoric. It's why white supremacists feel emboldened by Donald Trump. So this is, uh, I mean, just a terrible human being. And even though Joe Biden doesn't deserve to win in a landslide because he also is a bad person, Trump deserves to lose in a landslide. He deserves to lose and go down in flames. So that way, this type of politics is thoroughly and permanently delegitimized. But unfortunately, in America... When racism is still a giant problem, when it's embedded in all of our institutions, both politically and socially, this is probably going to be something that uh, stays around for centuries. Because you can't just like pretend racism isn't a thing. You can only try to suppress it so long until it rears its ugly head once again. And the way it's manifesting with Donald Trump, it's, uh, it's not new. It's always been there, just waiting for its moment to reemerge. And, you know, fascism, white supremacy really got its second win with Donald Trump. So I hope he loses in a landslide because this is just a terrible human being to say this about Ilhan Omar. So lately, Bernie Sanders has been um, criticized more than usual by the left. And it's because, you know, he currently has tunnel vision. He is just looking to November 3rd, and he wants to make sure that Donald Trump is defeated. And, you know, I talked about this uh, when I was on uh, Savage Joy's program, and Bernie Sanders, it seems like he blames himself for Donald Trump's victory in 2016, e even though that's, 
that's completely irrational. I don't think that he's responsible for Trump's victory. Uh, you know, maybe he feels as if he played some responsibility. He shouldn't blame himself, but he does. So, you know, this time he wants to make sure that there's no doubts, there's no way that any centrists are able to blame him for Trump's victory should he win again. Uh, but we all know that there's nothing that he can say or do to convince them. They're going to blame him no matter what. We know that the narrative has already been predetermined. If Joe Biden wins, that's going to be proof that centrism is more popular and uh, makes candidates more electorally viable. But um, if Joe Biden loses, of course, we'll be blamed because Joe Biden was pushed too far left by individuals like Bernie Sanders and AOC and whatnot. So, you know, there's nothing that Bernie Sanders can say or do to convince centrists that he's not the enemy because these are bad faith actors. And, you know, this is intra-party warfare. They're on one side, Bernie's on another. He's trying to remake the party. And a lot of these blue checkmark grifters just want to make sure that the status quo remains in place so they can get a job in D.C. But having said that, you know, it's made Bernie Sanders kind of insufferable <laughs> in some ways, admittedly, um, because he, he won't criticize Joe Biden. And I get it. You don't want to say anything that might tip the scales in Trump's favor. Uh, but I think that Hassan Piker described it best when he was speaking at the DNC convention, that this is basically like watching cuck porn to see Bernie Sanders, you know, have to puff up Joe Biden when we all know Joe Biden is a neoliberal centrist. He, he's not going to be someone who's able to meet this moment, hence why we were all, you know, behind Bernie Sanders. But in an interview with TYT, Bernie Sanders spoke with Jen Uger and Anna Kasparian, and this interview was great because Bernie Sanders told us what we needed to hear, what I expected. I, uh, I told people on Twitter, Bernie is probably going to be difficult to listen to until after the election because he's not going to say anything bad about Joe Biden. But that doesn't mean that all of a sudden he's going to be a cheerleader for Joe Biden. In fact, in this interview, Bernie Sanders laid out pretty specifically that he is going to criticize Joe Biden. He is going to pressure Joe Biden. And the reason why this is important is because Bernie Sanders was really effective at pressuring the Obama administration. So when Obama was going to come up with this grand bargain to cut Social Security, it was Bernie Sanders who stopped that from happening. So we don't want Bernie Sanders to, like, plug his ears and cover his eyes and pretend like Joe Biden is perfect because Trump is so terrible. He may be doing that right now, but long term, Bernie Sanders is our ally. Bernie Sanders is fighting for what's right, and he reassured us of that in this interview, which I, I was very happy to see. If Biden does win, He's going to push for public option. Obviously, you're in favor of Medicare for all. Where does that leave you? Do you do you support him in, in pushing forward the public option? Uh, is there a progressive pushback and fight for Medicare for all uh, in a Biden administration? Well, I will tell you where it leaves me. Uh, everything being equal, uh, if the Democrats gain control over the Senate, I want to remind all of the viewers, of course, the presidential election is enormously important. Do not forget about the Senate. Democrats stand a reasonable chance of gaining control of the Senate. If they do, Cenk, I will be the chairman of the subcommittee on health. And let me tell my good friends in the healthcare industry and the pharmaceutical industry that if I get that position, and I believe I will, uh, your world is going to change. So of course, we're gonna continue the push for Medicare for all. Now, the bill that I presented was a four year transition. I didn't go to Medicare for all in one day because I don't think you can do that. In the first year, Biden, you know, uh, Biden now uh, wants to see the eligibility age for Medicare go from 65 down to 60. There hasn't been enough discussion on that, that's important. The first year of my bill, four year transition, has it go down to 55. So in the first year, what I would like to see is us lower that age to 55 and cover all of the kids in America on year one. That is something I certainly will be pushing on. I will also be pushing to make absolutely clear that we end the outrageous collusion and price fixing of the pharmaceutical industry and that the people of our country do not pay higher prices for prescription drugs than the people of any other country on earth. Also on that committee, which I will be number two, uh, the Health Education Labor Committee, Pension Committee, 
we will pass a $15 an hour minimum wage. And what I'm working on, Cenk and Anna, right now is what I call a 100 day proposal. I want Democrats to come out of that gate very, very rapidly. It is not business as usual. We count, we don't have six months to study an issue. We know what we have to do for the American people in education, in climate change, in the economy, in healthcare. Let's do it. Let us try to restore the confidence of the American people in the political process. Let them know that there are some of us who are fighting for the working class in this country, and we are going to deliver. So um, that was a great interview. That is exactly what we all needed to hear, even if it's not necessarily surprising, even if we know Bernie Sanders, for purposes of political expediency, was biting his tongue because he didn't want to criticize Biden and end up inadvertently helping Trump. Like, we knew that he would do this. It's just, it's nice to hear him say it. Like, I think a lot of people are currently holding their fire and biting their tongues. But the minute Joe Biden wins, you're going to see him bombarded with criticism from the left because everybody is pretty realistic about what to expect from Joe Biden. I don't see very many pro-Biden individuals. I see anti-Trump people uh, that recognize Biden is just a means to an end, that end being ousting Donald Trump. But everybody knows, like, we can't go back to brunch. So what do we do? Well, Bernie Sanders said, I'm working on a 100 day proposal. It is going to be it is not going to be business as usual. So what he's telling us, what he's assuring us is he's going to fight. All right. That's what I wanted to hear. I think that a lot of people wanted to hear that. And again, it's not surprising, but it's just nice to get that, you know, uh, reaffirmed from the horse's mouth. He says uh, he'll be the chairman of the subcommittee on health if Democrats take back the Senate. That sounds phenomenal. He will continue to push for Medicare for all and try to influence Biden on this. Now, this is important because Bernie Sanders has a lot of influence. And so if the left just by itself tries to rise up and do grassroots action, I mean, we saw what happened during Occupy Wall Street. There was no leadership. But this time, if there's leadership, that gives us at least a little bit more of a chance to influence this administration, or at least stop him from doing the most harmful things he plans on doing. He says, we'll pass a $15 minimum wage. Okay. And then he also says, we don't have six months to study an issue. We know what we have to do for the American people. This is important because we have to assume Democrats have two years, two years of power if they take back the Senate and the White House. That's it. After that, you're going to lose one of the houses of government. Assume that you will. If that happens, that's it. Your window to act has been closed. So if you do not change things substantially, change the material conditions in this country, then we're going to see probably a worse version of Donald Trump in 2024. I mean, currently Tom Cotton is laying the groundwork for a presidential run. He is worse than Donald Trump. He is a fascist who actually doesn't put his foot in his mouth, who's actually going to be more effective at getting fascist things done. So, you know, if you want people to not be lured into fascism and white supremacy, you have to make sure that they're not susceptible to that type of radicalization and not desperate. So you have to change the material conditions to make it less likely that some demagogue will come along and say, hey, here's the answer to all of your problems. We have to stop that. And you stop that by doing things that help people. Now, I'll be perfectly honest. To the extent that the left is able to push Joe Biden to the left, not really optimistic about that. In fact, I don't think we're going to push him left because we have an extensive history that we can look at with regard to Joe Biden and see he is governed as a moderate Republican. So when he is in power, I expect him to basically be a moderate Republican. Having said that, though, that doesn't mean that we don't try to push him left. We don't just say, oh, well, he's a moderate Republican. Surprise, surprise. No, we, we give him hell. We make sure that the minute he is sworn in, we are on his ass like stank on shit. You're not going to get a pass. You wanted this job. The establishment moved heaven and earth to make sure you were president and not Bernie Sanders. So now you better put the fuck up. You're not going to have a fun time. And so we might not be able to pressure you, but still, we will be a thorn in your side for the entirety of your tenure as president if you are lucky enough to get elected. May not influence you, but we're going to try. 
Um, now, another thing that is interesting with regard to Bernie Sanders and uh, a Biden presidency is Bernie Sanders is currently positioning himself for a position in Biden's cabinet. He wants to be labor secretary. Now, I don't know how I feel about this. I think I'm leaning towards, please don't do it, Bernie. But let's go to some details here. Politico reports Senator Bernie Sanders is hoping to be part of Joe Biden's potential administration and has expressed a particular interest in becoming labor secretary. Two people familiar with the conversations tell Politico. I can confirm he's trying to figure out how to land that role or something like it, said one person close to the Vermont senator. He personally does have an interest in it. Sanders on Wednesday declined to confirm or deny that he's putting his name forward for the position. Right now, I am focused on seeing that Biden is elected president, he told Politico. Politico. That's what my main focus is. Former Sanders campaign manager Fash Shakir said Sanders has not talked directly with anyone on the Biden campaign about a future role, but plans to push Biden, his former Senate colleague, to include progressive voices in both the transition and in a potential new administration. Yet, two other people close to Sanders, including one former aide, said the senator has expressed interest in being in the administration should Biden win in November. Sanders has been making his push for the top job at the Labor Department in part by reaching out to allies on the transition team one person familiar with the process said i'm torn on this because on one hand i think that bernie sanders has done so much to elect joe biden campaign for him more so than anyone else who's run for president that like he he should be rewarded for it like joe biden should reward him for helping him get power having said that though i don't think it's a good idea overall for bernie sanders to be labor secretary now i could be persuaded i'm open-minded but uh, Nathan J. Robinson, I think, had the best argument. If Bernie Sanders is part of a Biden administration, you've basically got to be a cheerleader. You're not going to be criticizing him and putting pressure on him. We don't want that. We want Bernie Sanders to actually put pressure on Joe Biden because out of all of the people who has a shot at influencing Joe Biden, it's Bernie Sanders. Not only would he be the most vocal, but he actually would have the most sway since he is a very popular politician. I don't like this idea. Now, um, on top of that, if Bernie Sanders is labor secretary and he's no longer a senator, so what happens there? We have no one in the Senate who's a true leftist. I mean, you have other people who are all right. Jeff Merkley's okay. Ed Markey, pretty good. Elizabeth Warren, not good. <laughs> I mean, she has her moments. Uh, she's not the worst Democrat, but not a leader by any stretch of the imagination. So if you remove Bernie Sanders from the Senate, then who's going to introduce Medicare for all? Who's going to push Senate Democrats to do the right thing? It just, I don't like it. It almost is like, He'd be silenced in a way if he became the labor secretary, even if admittedly he can do a lot of good in that position. Um, now, AOC was asked about this in an interview with Jake Tapper. Here's what she had to say. Politico is reporting uh, that Senator Bernie Sanders, who you endorsed for the Democratic presidential nomination, Sanders has expressed an interest in potentially serving as Biden's labor secretary if Biden wins the White House. How crucial is it? To the progressive movement that Biden's Biden offers an important position to Bernie Sanders in a Biden cabinet should that happen should Biden win well what I think is is extremely important and what I think what a lot of people kind of misunderstand about the progressive movement is that it wasn't a slogan when Bernie ran on on saying not me us and so it's not just about what, where Bernie Sanders is next term or what role uh, that Senator Sanders is playing, but it's really about who the Biden administration is choosing to lead agencies across the board. And, um, you know, I, I am not familiar personally with, um, with any of Senator Sanders' uh, requests or non-requests. I, I do not know uh, personally about the veracity of this, but... Um, but, you know, I believe that it's critically important that the Biden administration appoint progressive leaders, whether it's in labor, whether it's in, tre in the Treasury, whether it's, you know, Secretary of Education, et cetera, because the fact of the matter is, is that this isn't just about the progressive movement. This is about making sure that we're not just 
going back to how things were and rewinding the tape before the Trump administration. But this is about making sure how, how are we going to not just make up for lost time, but leap into the future and actually ensure that we are making the investments and policy decisions that will create an advanced American society. And frankly, conservative uh, appointments will not get us there. So what she's saying, I totally agree with. Like, if you don't actually change the material conditions that led to Donald Trump, we're going to see another turnover in four years, maybe eight years. But either way, we can expect an even worse Trumpian-like figure to come along, another demagogue who's going to do even more damage because there are fascists who are more competent than Donald Trump who want power. So what AOC is saying here is just appointing conservatives with bad ideas that's not an option if you're serious about fixing the country. So if it's not Bernie Sanders or progressives in your administration, then at a minimum, putting Republicans in your administration would be beyond idiotic. So why would you do that when this party is a far-right extremist party? Why would you let their bad ideas influence you, even if it's a little bit? I mean, Joe Biden is basically a moderate Republican. So there's one Republican, don't need any more in your administration. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, the real work starts once Joe Biden is elected. And to the extent that we can pressure him, we should do that. We should try. But really, I think that this is going to be a test for the left. This is going to be, you know, a period of time where we focus on coalition building. We try to grow our power, you know, reform the systems uh, electorally where we can, institutionally. We do what we can, but we have four years to act. And what we're getting is a short-lived victory. We have to actually fix the conditions that led to Donald Trump. Otherwise, we're not really fixing anything. We're just giving ourselves a temporary break from fascism. Uh, but we need to stop fascism permanently because I don't think the planet can take another four years of a fascist president. I have previously expressed reservations about Bernie Sanders becoming Joe Biden's labor secretary, and um, apparently the people over at Fox News, uh, ghouls such as Stuart Barney, they also don't really want Bernie Sanders to be Joe Biden's labor secretary, but for completely different reasons than I have. Take a look. Yep. Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bernie Sanders, the socialist, he wants to be labor secretary if Joe Biden gets elected. I don't really want to hear any more about this, Ashley, but you're going to tell me anyway. <laughs> yes, I am. Why not? Uh, people familiar with conversations claim Sanders has been making a push for the top job at the Labor Department, reaching out to allies on Biden's transition team, touting the need for progressive voices in a new administration. It's right up your alley, Stu. Sanders is neither <laughs> denying nor confirming the reports, but he has thrown his support behind him. Uh, Joe Biden campaigning for him in Michigan and in uh, New Hampshire. And Biden is already being pushed, as we know, to appoint progressives to senior roles in his administration. Sanders' bid could also find support from union officials. No big surprise there. Um, because, you know, he, he, he has some influence over, over those unions who also have some influence over Biden's pick for the Labor Department. Sanders has long touted making it easier, of course, for workers to organize. He wants to raise the minimum wage. He's also a big fan of socialized medicine. But others say there's zero chance of Bernie Sanders running the Labor Department with one close ally saying he's a, quote, lone ranger to a fault, unquote. Just so long as you don't tell me that Senator Elizabeth Warren is in line for the Treasury Secretary. <laughs> Just stay away from that there, Ashley, please. That would be please. cool. I won't do that. <laughs> I don't think that they realize this, but they just inadvertently made the case as to why Bernie Sanders should be Joe Biden's labor secretary. We were at the same position, albeit for different reasons, and maybe they convinced me a little bit. Uh, they said, Sanders has long touted making it easier, of course, for workers to organize. He wants to raise the minimum wage. He's also a big fan of socialized medicine. If you tell me that Bernie being labor secretary gets us closer to socialized medicine, I say, sign me the fuck up immediately, because that sounds absolutely phenomenal. So it's funny because they are so deep in their right wing neoliberal bubble that they probably do actually believe the bullshit that they're spewing. And they don't even realize that they're making the case for Bernie Sanders. The things that they're citing are incredibly popular.
But also, as they say these things about Bernie Sanders, reasons why he shouldn't be Joe Biden's labor secretary, understand that they are tacitly admitting that they've been lying about Joe Biden being a radical socialist. Because all this time, the Republican Party has been very disciplined in trying to convince us that Joe Biden is basically a socialist. Some people even say he's a Marxist on the right. But by differentiating between him and Bernie Sanders, what you are telling us is that you have been lying this entire time. Not much of a shock to people who know better, but your audience has got to pick up on this. You've led your audience to believe that Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders are identical. When, you know, from my perspective as a leftist, they are diametrically opposed. Joe Biden, ideologically speaking, is more aligned with people like Stuart Varney than he is with Bernie Sanders or myself. So it's interesting because Stuart Varney, in theory, he has an ideal candidate in Joe Biden. They agree on quite a bit. Joe Biden is a neoliberal. Stuart Varney is a neoliberal. They both believe in free market solutions to policy problems. They don't believe that we should opt for more public ownership. They think that uh, everything should be uh, controlled by private multinational corporations. Governance is about less governments and uh, you know more about empowering individuals, less collectivism. Now, Joe Biden is a liberal for the most part, but he's basically a moderate Republican, right? Believes in some liberal ideas, strengthening the uh, social safety net a little bit, but making cuts when necessary. So it's shocking to me that Fox News all this time has been pretending to be so outraged about the threat that Joe Biden poses because he's a socialist when Joe Biden is not a socialist. I wish he were a socialist because if he were a socialist, I would actually be excited about him being the president. But I'm not. I'm dreading it. Joe Biden is just not Donald Trump. People are not supporting Joe Biden because uh, they love Joe Biden. They're pro Joe Biden. They think he's going to usher in this era of change and prosperity. They support Joe Biden because he's not Donald Trump. So the fact that, you know, Republicans are so anti Joe Biden, it just reveals how hackish they are. Stuart Varney is a hack. Again, Joe Biden is more ideologically aligned with people like Stuart Varney than he is with Bernie Sanders. But because he has a D in front of his name, well, Stuart Varney, that's more than enough. That's more than enough. You can put a D in front of uh, Donald Trump's name, Mitt Romney's name, uh, any Republican's name, and all of a sudden, these hacks at Fox News would oppose them just because they have a D next to their name. They're quintessential hacks. This is about doing propaganda for the Republican Party because Fox News, their advertisers are the same companies and individuals who happen to be donors to the Republican Party. So they know where their bread is buttered. Hence why they push the Republican Party so relentlessly because their interests align. So, um, you know, I just had to talk about this because it's funny. These Fox News idiots, they think that they're convincing people, but the only individuals who you're convincing are the ones who already drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, and they're already MAGA cultists and the rich people who watch Fox Business. But, I mean, um, if a normal person tunes in and sees you talking about this, uh, sees you talking about how terrible it is that Bernie wants to make sure that wor workers can organize and they get a higher minimum wage and they get free health care, you're not going to turn people off. You're going to turn them on to the policies that Bernie Sanders is talking about. So good job. Keep talking about Bernie Sanders because, hell, you may even convince me that he should be labor secretary. Well, there is a very, very big election taking place tomorrow, as everybody knows who's watching this video. And even though we may not necessarily know the results of the election tomorrow night, we still will be learning very soon who our next president will be. So I wanted to take some time to share what we can expect depending on the result. So if it is the case that Joe Biden emerges victorious and he defeats Donald Trump, I think that all of us owe it to ourselves to just breathe a long sigh of relief knowing that we got Donald Trump out of power. Now, he may go very loudly and whine about it. He may be insufferable for a couple of months, but so long as we got that victory, his time is limited. That's a good feeling. And there hasn't been much to be hopeful about as of late, but we can at least know that he will be going very soon and the Trump era will be coming to an end. Having said that, though, 
the end of Donald Trump's presidency does not necessarily mean that Trumpism is going to go away. In fact, I think it could be with us for quite some time. And if Joe Biden does not take substantial action during these next four years, then I think it's a guarantee that we're going to see someone emerge in the future who is much worse than Donald Trump. So here's what I say to everyone. If Joe Biden is elected, the left liberals, Democratic Party loyalists, people who are not Republicans but don't necessarily like the Democratic Party, independents, now is not the time for brunch. Yes, it is the case that Joe Biden is not Donald Trump. He will be better than Donald Trump, not do as much damage as Donald Trump, but acknowledge that Joe Biden is not your friend. He is your political enemy and we must resist him. Make sure we apply nonstop pressure on him and make his life a living hell. Because guess what? The Democratic Party establishment moved heaven and earth to make sure that Bernie Sanders was defeated and we got anyone but Bernie. And Joe Biden happened to be the person who has resisted change at a time when our country and planet need change more than ever. Now, understand, it is going to be almost impossible to push Joe Biden left. He is going to resist change. He's going to embrace corporatism. I wouldn't be surprised um, if he stacked his cabinet with Wall Street executives. Having said that, though, that doesn't mean we don't try to pressure him and try to move him left. And where the left is going to have any, um, I think, sway is maybe stopping him from doing the most harmful things. Because remember, when Obama was in power, he got away with doing a lot of terrible things because the media applied no pressure to him. He faced zero scrutiny and let the Republicans basically run roughshod on him while he just sat back and pretended as if he was hopeless in the situation when we know now that that's not necessarily true. He didn't do a lot of things because he is a moderate Republican. That's how he described himself. So we have no reason to just wait and give Joe Biden a chance. If he's lucky enough to be elected, we have to immediately make his life a living hell unless he actually is willing to listen to the left. Do I think that's going to happen? I'm not too optimistic about that because guess what? Uh, we have an extensive record that we can look at with regard to Joe Biden and see exactly how he's going to govern. So if the left uses this time to uh, build our coalition, make sure we increase our political power, then we can actually make some really good use of this next four years. It's not a guarantee that fascism is gone forever. Trumpian politics will probably remain a thing. It will be pretty prevalent within the 2024 primary. So we have to make sure that we stop that from happening. How do we stop that from happening? We try to pressure the Democratic Party as hard as it may be to do at least some things to materially improve people's lives. And if uh, Joe Biden can do just a little bit, he can stop a future disaster. Now, what I'm anticipating is Joe Biden to basically do some good things via executive order reinstate the DACA program, right? Try to get us back into the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, try to do something with regard to the Iran nuclear deal. Some things that, of course, are indisputably good, objectively good. Uh, the problem is that a lot of the things that are good that he wants to do can likely be undone by the next president, assuming that he just kind of like doesn't make any strong legislative pushes and does a lot of things via executive order. But he can do a few good things. He can mandate masks nationally and make testing for COVID-19 widely available. So that way we can purchase them ourselves online or at grocery stores. This would be huge in containing the spread of the virus. He may capitalize on the opportunity to raise the minimum wage. And he says he supports $15 an hour. Let's see if he holds strong. I have a feeling that if Democrats even try to raise the minimum wage, they won't opt for 15. They'd probably opt for 12 instead. Um, we'll see what happens there. You know, I think that he's probably going to take executive action to expand healthcare where he can. I don't know that he's actually going to try to tackle health care reform legislatively unless it is, in fact, overturned by the Supreme Court, the ACA, that is. Um, the problem with this is, you know, you can't just put another Band-Aid on the situation and hope that that fixes all of the problems. And if he does, 
opt for healthcare reform. He says that he supports a public option, but when he describes a public option at the presidential debates, it doesn't really sound like a public option. So my expectations are very, very low for Joe Biden. Sure, he adopted, you know, some of Bernie Sanders' elements with regard to climate change and spoke with the Sunrise Movement. Uh, does that mean that when push comes to shove, when corporate interests are in his ears, he's going to adopt that exact plan? I doubt it. So listen, hope for the best. Try to do what we can. Push him as much as we possibly can to do good, to mitigate the damage that he will likely cause. But go into this clear-eyed. Go into this not delusional as we were in 2008 and 2012. Don't expect Joe Biden to be your ally. Yes, he's better than Trump. We used him as a tool to oust Donald Trump from power. But he is not our political ally. He has an agenda that is antithetical to what most of the left wants. He is a neoliberal, free market capitalist. When we see capitalism destroying our planet, wreaking havoc on our communities. So he's got to take action. And so, you know, I don't necessarily know what to expect with Joe Biden. Him and the Democratic Party, assuming they're able to take back the Senate, have a very short window, two years to act until they either lose the Senate or the House. We have to assume that that's all that they got. If they do not take action, enough action to actually improve people's conditions materially, then they are paving the way for more dissatisfaction and as a result, radicalization that will lead to the success of someone like Matt Gates or Tom Cotton in 2024, who I think is worse than Donald Trump. They may not have mean tweets. They may not be as bombastic and narcissistic, but they are real fascists. And if they get power, that will be extremely dangerous. They will silence their opposition. They will consolidate power. They will suppress voters. So Democrats have to act, and it is incumbent on us to pressure them, but more importantly, use this time to educate people. Don't let everyone go to brunch and go to sleep. Let them acknowledge that the Democratic Party isn't meeting our expectations and not meeting their expectations. We support Medicare for All. Why aren't we getting that? We support a legalization of marijuana. Why aren't we getting that? So we'll see. But I want people to not delude themselves into thinking that Joe Biden is their friend. Yes, we voted for him in large part to oust Donald Trump, but nobody is pro-Biden. They're just anti-Trump. I don't think I've ever, ever met anyone who's like pro-Joe Biden. Everybody's just voting for him to stop Donald Trump. So, I mean, at the end of the day, even though Joe Biden is going to resist change, we have to acknowledge that we fight no matter what. Bully him. Pressure him the minute he gains power. On day one, the minute he's sworn in. I don't care about celebrations. Get to work. We've got things that you need to do to stop multiple crises from getting worse. So uh, make it happen. By the time most of you see this, tomorrow will be the big day. And um, a lot is on the line. And I'm um, assuming we're able to learn who wins on election night or shortly after. I wanted to talk about what we can expect if Donald Trump does in fact get another four years as president. Now, the question is, how much more damage can he cause? Because all of the things that we expected him to get accomplished easily, he already did in his first four years. He got us out of the Paris Climate Accord. He withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal. He gutted the ACA. I mean, it's basically death by a thousand cuts, but his new Supreme Court justice may give it its final death blow. So what can he possibly accomplish with four more years? Well, the answer to that is quite a bit. Um, but before I talk about my expectations, if Trump does in fact win re-election, I want to go back to November 7th of 2016, where I talked about my expectations back then. And I uh, shared my thoughts about what we could expect if Donald Trump was elected. And as you're going to see, a lot of the things that I anticipated did in fact end up coming to fruition. If it's the case that Donald Trump wins tomorrow, I'll be glad to know that Hillary Clinton wasn't rewarded after rigging the primary against Bernie Sanders, but in spite of this short-lived satisfaction, I'll be utterly terrified at the direction that he's going to be taking the country in. So he might back out of the TPP and install term limits on members of Congress, but I'll expect him to take immediate action that will be incredibly harmful to the entire country 
and the world. So as he stated, I expect him to rip up the Paris Climate Agreement on day one, which will exacerbate the threat of climate change. He'll also tear up the Iran nuclear deal on day one as well, making war with them a greater likelihood. He'll also fight to repeal Obamacare, which will lead to millions of Americans losing their health insurance myself included. He'll immediately attempt to fill the open seat on the Supreme Court with an extremist like Scalia, and his Supreme Court justices will influence the court's decisions for the next three to four decades. Civil rights will be under attack. Gay people could lose the right to marry. This will affect me. And women could lose their right to a safe and legal abortion. This will affect 50% of the population. White nationalists will feel empowered if he wins, and racism will likely augment, leading to nationwide turmoil, not to mention his fascist anti-Muslim policies will create more extremism. Now, the U.S. might even default on our national debt, as he's indicated he might let happen. And he'll also implement a Syrian no-fly zone like him and his VP have been planning to do. And that will lead to the deaths of Syrian civilians, not to mention the innocent civilians he said he plans on killing, the family members of ISIS. So if Donald Trump wins, this will be a very dark time in U.S. history. And this is something that is scary. The thought of it is really scary. I've literally had nightmares about Donald Trump being elected. He's a very terrifying politician uh, and a very terrifying person in general. And I don't think that I want the country to go backwards with Donald Trump. So uh, if Donald Trump wins, we're going to have to fight our asses off like you would never imagine to make sure that he doesn't destroy the country. Uh, and I don't even know where to begin if he wins. Where do we start? He has so many harmful policies that would help destroy the country, that this is going to be a huge battle. It's going to be horrible. So if Donald Trump wins, then it's a sad day for America. So for the most part, I think I was pretty spot on, but it's not like I, you know, have a crystal ball or anything. All of the predictions that I made about Donald Trump, these were things that were pretty obvious. And I think a second term with Donald Trump is going to be a little bit more difficult to predict if he does get a second term. But the question is, uh, did he live up to my expectations after we saw what I expected back in 2016? And the answer is uh, no. I mean, sure, he didn't do all the bad things that I thought. You know, he didn't make us default on our national debt. He didn't institute a Syrian no-fly zone, but he did increase drone strikes by 400%. He did assassinate a top Iranian general just this year. I know it seems like it was years ago, but that was this year, putting us on the brink of war with Iran. But still, having said that, even though he didn't do all of the bad things I had anticipated, he still didn't live up to my expectations because even knowing he would be a disaster, even knowing his victory in 2016 would put us in one of the darkest times in American history, he still is worse than I anticipated. Believe it or not. And I say this because there were things that we couldn't possibly predict or account for back in 2016, like COVID-19. The extent to which he has mishandled a worldwide pandemic can never be overstated. Nearly 225,000 Americans are dead because of Donald Trump, because he refused to take this virus seriously. It's his fault. The blood is on his hands. And when you consider that and factor in his continuation of the war machine, he has officially reached George W. Bush levels of destruction. And with another four years, he could be worse than George W. Bush. On top of that, Donald Trump is an anomaly, even though you know, his policies don't necessarily differ from most Republicans. He's an anomaly in the sense that he does pose a unique threat to democracy. He has pushed American political institutions to their limits, to a breaking point, to where we are on the verge of losing democracy, diminishing our democracy, eroding democracy even more. And he has undermined democracy more so than any other president in modern American history history. His refusal to commit to a peaceful transition of power is shocking. Gassing peaceful protesters, extrajudicially murdering United States citizens, and then openly bragging about it, committing to run for a third term even though he knows that is unconstitutional, having his legal team construct ways that he can remain in power even if he loses, even if Joe Biden wins the popular vote and the Electoral College. His team is trying to find ways to make it so he clings to power. 
He is by far the most substantial threat to democracy our nation has faced in a very long time. And on top of that, we now have even more concentration camps in our country. And at these facilities, we see widespread abuses. COVID-19 is running rampant. Women are getting forced hysterectomies. This is fascism. Not on the scale that we saw in Nazi Germany. But if he gets four more years, who knows what this country is going to look like? I'm not saying that America cannot survive another four years with Donald Trump, but I'm also not saying that it can. And if he gets another four years in 2024, American democracy will be hanging on by a thread. America as we know it will not look the same if it even exists, if we don't start seeing states attempt to secede from the nation because of the damage that he has caused. So what more can he possibly do? He's already done so much. Well, if he gets four more years, he may get another Supreme Court pick. Maybe two, possibly. You never know what can happen. And I would guess and say that, you know, if another seat becomes available, it's because a conservative stepped down. But we don't know what could happen. Another liberal justice could inexplicably die. And Trump, all of a sudden is in a position to uh, widen the majority on the Supreme Court, 7-2 instead of 6-3. Additionally, we may actually see Roe v. Wade and Obergefell v. Hodges be overturned. The Republican Party conservatives have never been in a more advantageous position when it comes to the judiciary. So in the event these landmark cases get overturned, we have an administration that will not do anything about it. Instead, he will celebrate it. COVID-19 is still likely going to be gone sometime during Trump's next term. But knowing he will do absolutely nothing to contain the spread, we know what's going to happen. It will likely linger on longer here than any other country, even after vaccines are widely available and distributed, causing even more unnecessary deaths when he should be doing everything in his power to contain the virus. We can expect him to continue to escalate with Iran, possibly killing even more military generals, doing more military exercises along their border, possibly getting us into an all-out war with Iran, even if it's inadvertent. We will continue to see civil unrest because with zero reform, we will see more police officers assassinate unarmed black Americans across this country. Trump is not even going to attempt to ameliorate the situation, stop the crisis. He's not even going to try to meet with protesters. He's not going to try to opt for any police reform. He's just going to try to suppress the protests. And who knows what authoritarian means he will use to suppress those protests, putting us down an even more dangerous path so when an even more competent fascist like Tom Cotton comes to power, he will have so much power after Trump has consolidated the power of the executive branch that I don't even know what to expect. Like, it's just... It's disaster waiting. And after serving two consecutive terms as the president, when Trump goes away, the Trump era will basically stay for a very long time. Trumpism, Trumpian politics will remain popular because Trump proved by winning another term that this form of politics is popular. It plays well with the base. White supremacy, fascism, these are things that actually appeal to the Republican base. And even if it's not you know, going to make him popular with most Americans, it's enough for him to win. So they will remember this and we will see even more fascism. They will be even more emboldened, the fascists, the white supremacists, than they are now. And uh, perhaps the most dreadful thought is that when he leaves office in four years, that will leave us with six, maybe seven years left to act. If we're going to meet the IPCC's 12-year deadline when it comes to climate change, the situation, it, it, honestly, you can't really know what to expect with another four years of Donald Trump because we've gotten used to the damage. We've absorbed all of these blows. Our democracy has absorbed all of these blows. But when it's all said and done, when we look back at this, he would have caused, after eight years, so much damage that it will take a generation to be undone. And the problem is that his legacy will uh, linger on for decades because he has the judiciary. He filled the judiciary. So if Donald Trump wins tomorrow, I think that a lot of us are going to rightfully feel disappointed because we will see a continuation of one of the darkest times in American politics. 
Well, that's it. I don't think I have anything left on my heart to talk about. I'm ready for the election to take place. Um, more specifically, I'm ready for the election to be over because, oh my god, this election, I feel like it has been going on for decades and I am ready to not be in election mode. I'm ready for hopefully a little bit of a break where maybe politics is somewhat boring again. Not likely, but let's just end the election. Uh, so anyways, uh, we're not going to close the show unless we thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members who make it possible. Thank you all so much for helping us, not just to uh, survive, but thrive as well. I'm clearly running out of steam, so I'm just going to shut up. I will see you all next week for the election episode. That is going to be very interesting. I don't plan on live streaming that. I may jump on other channels' live streams, but um, you will see my reaction as soon as we know something. But uh, I'm not necessarily expecting results on Tuesday night. So we'll see. We'll watch it together. And you can follow me on Twitter at Humanist Report if you, uh, if you want to see my reaction in real time, which will probably be nothing but anxiety and uh, alarmism <laughs> because that's, that's how I am. Like any election, I'm just automatically like antsy. Um, and I've got a lot of like energy that uh, is difficult to shake off. So <sighs> buckle up, folks.